Welcome back to another episode of Comrades, a weekly discussion of the FX series The Americans. My name is Scott Malkus. I am the TV editor of PopDose.com, and with me as always is my co-host, Jeff Marsick, the awesome story guy who wrote some comic books. Boy, that really botched that intro up. <laughs> the awesome story guy. I'm going to have he a this, made like that. Yeah, I'm the awesome story guy. Huh? <laughs> um, Jeff has written two fantastic comic books. Jeff, tell us what they are, please. Uh, one is about a special ops team led by a female zombie, which is something you don't see every day, called Z-Girl and the Four Tigers. Nice. And uh, if you're a fan of Hellboy or BPRD from Dark Horse Comics, you'll you'll enjoy it. Uh, check it out at zgirl.org. And then uh, wrote a, a, a comic about a hitman who ends up putting a contract out on himself called Dead Man's Party, and that's at deadmansparty.org. And if you like action and thriller type stuff, that's uh, that's the book to check out. And is that book continuing? I, originally, that was going to be a short series, right? But it's are you yeah. So it's, it was supposed to be. Uh, it was it was originally slated to be four issues, and we're actually going to end up doing five, I think. Nice. But uh, yeah, so it's like one arc, and then we'll take a break and come back and do another arc. That way, we can kind of package them as graphic novels and stuff. Sweet. So it's five issues, and then the next arc will be the, like issue six or a new story, correct? Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. If anybody is looking for some really good uh, pulp fiction, and I mean that in a, in, in a good sense, uh, Dead Man's Party kicks butt. I can attest. It's awesome. Reminds me of uh, reminds me of Bendis stuff, uh, aka Goldfish. That type. Oh, that's Just, that's a that's a great compliment. Thank you. Oh, I mean it, man. It's a good story. I like it. It's a great setup. That that early Bendis stuff, Goldfish, Torso, Fire, Jinx, yep, Jinx, yeah, whatever. That, those are awesome. Yeah, Torso in particular is. If anybody's from Cleveland listening to this, I think we have a half a listener from Cleveland who listens to this <laughs> podcast. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a great story, uh, Torso, dealing with Elliot Ness in the city of Cleveland and one of this country's first serial killers. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. As he described it, I think it's the Untouchables meets Silence of the Lambs. That's a good way of describing it. That is, yeah. And I think it's an unsolved uh, unsolved mystery. I think you're right. Un- yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we're going to get going because uh, I hate to do this to you folks because I know how much you love uh, me just kind of going on and on. But uh, we have our limited time this week. So we're going to try and get into it. Fortunately, the producers of the uh, the Americans decided to help us out and make an episode that was very straight. <laughs> Very streamlined and uh, one that we can discuss in about an hour. Isn't that right, Jeff? Well, it, yeah, it's, it's funny because when I was watching this, normally as we go through, we go beat by beat, all the things that happen. And like I'm looking through the notes that I that I'm you know that I wrote down, and there it's like the same thing keeps popping up, you know, several times. And I was I was thinking the same thing that it's going to be relatively easy to uh, to talk about this one. Yeah, I think that when I was watching this, I mean the. I mean, I must admit to our listeners that I'm I'm flying solo with no notes today. I'm hands free because uh, because the one per- recurring thought I kept getting during this episode is this is an Emmy worthy uh, uh, acting performance by Matthew Reese. I think that uh, uh, wow, uh, that it, that performance in this episode was was brilliant, and he runs the gamut of emotions and. Um, the normally, uh, I, would, I would guess he would be the optimistic or the positive one of this entire uh, duo. Uh, he is at, when he goes to the darkest of dark places, and you really see whatever uh, pent up emotions that he's been keeping for years kind of come to the surface. Um, and it, uh, and he just he just nailed it, you know. He well, nailed been, the whole we've, thing. We've been talking for a couple weeks now about how all this stuff. Like you said, he's the more uh, he's the more uh, emotional of the two, and the dirty deeds that he's had to do they they weigh on him. You know, we right. saw it especially uh, when he had to when he had to plant the bug on the computer, and he had that that college student was there, or the scientist, whatever was there at the wrong place, wrong time, and he had to kill him. 
you know, and uh, in the bar afterwards when he's with uh, when he's with the guy who helped him and the guy's like, this is, you know, it's, it's a rush and I really dig this stuff that you do. And Philip's like, yeah, um, I had to kill a guy, yeah. you know, and it's, and this was, the, so he's been, he's been running right on that knife edge of, you know, the, the tipping point of, of going, uh, uh, you know, sliding into a funk with his, with guilt and, and, you know, what he's got to do. Um, and then this was the episode that just shoved him uh, yeah. right off the edge. Yeah, and then the, the, I think that I, I try to think what the turning, what really shoved him over the edge. I, I mean, part of me, yeah, I, 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 the, the show opens and they they get inside that uh, this training camp for the uh, for Marshall the Eagle. Yes, Marshall Eagle, and uh, you know he's trying to take pictures. He has to, and he has to kill. I think it's three people. He kills a guy who catches him, and then he shoots. I think two other guys, two other soldiers, and killing the guy. He has to kill one guy by slicing his throat. He's trying to tell him to shut up. He's trying to tell him to be quiet, and he has to cut his throat. And it's interesting because that really messes with him. And then you cut to Elizabeth, who's walking through a cabin, and she just point blank shoots. Um, shoots a guy right in the head. This guy doesn't doesn't seem to affect her. She's very cold. I think you know she's very mechanical. But I think what really drove him over the edge was that that guy that they tied up that that Lewis. That, Lewis, who I still, I'm still trying to figure out what, I still have that reaction from last uh, week's episode where he reacted to this guy's name and everything. I don't know what that means. But um, that, where, where he was trying to do the right thing. Right. You know, trying to save an innocent to keep him from dying, and this guy dies. And, you know, it's, it's one thing, I, I, think, I think in his head, it's one thing when you're a soldier and you're fighting other soldiers those are the casualties of war, but it's another when it's like an innocent bystander. And uh, I think that twice, you know, that's what's happened. I think even he might be able to write off and justify, okay, the computer guy was in my way, blah, blah, blah. But here he was really, I think the computer guy influenced his decision to let's not kill the, the, the sanitate or the, the septic guy. Let's tie him up and then we'll leave him free, free, you know? And here he's trying to do the right thing and it, it backfires and uh, boy, does that boy does that just weigh heavy on his soul. And then, if, you know, speaking of soul, I mean, this was a very spiritual episode. It was yeah. a lot of talk about uh, I don't want to say religion, but just forgiveness and redemption, which are you know the you know big themes in the Bible, obviously. And uh, and that stuff, I felt like it's speaking to him. You know, I, I felt like it was speaking to both characters. To be honest with you, I think that that hearing that touched both of them and of course they've been programmed and they I mean i don't want to say programmed because that's their upbringing their upbringing in the soviet union was that there is no religion right right and so i i mean i don't know how you felt about that church scene you know they go to church with uh with page um because you know, it's uh youth sunday that's right church. it's youth sunday and uh mysteriously we don't see pages <laughs> we don't see pages friend this show i think has some is running it has some problems with the ch- child labor laws and they can't get all the <laughs> kid actors on the, the show at the same time but um <clears throat> yeah because where was henry we saw the three of them but we didn't see we didn't see henry he was at the beginning that's funny you say that do we have to go to church yeah but, right right where did this show, i think that they're like oh man long labor long hours we, we can only get one kid at a time. <laughs> I mean, it's, seriously, the past three weeks, I mean, it's either Paige or Henry on the show. It's not both of them, you know? Right. I think I, I think to my reaction this week, I was like, hey, wait, they're both on screen together. <laughs> so, um, well, that, that, that church scene, I love that church scene. I loved how, so it was, it was, uh, uh, Youth Sunday at the, at, at the church, and Paige is all, she's kind of giddy about showing up, and the first thing we see is the three of them sitting in the pew, and we see Paige first, and she just has that 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 look on her face of just you know pure happiness. She's got a mm-hmm. smile on her face, and the, the pastor's giving his giving his his spiel, and she's buying it, and she's just, you know, this is this is what it's all about. And then I think the next person we see is Philip, goes to the, goes to the end, the next person we see is Philip, and he's just looking like he's angry... It, it's just like he just knows that this is just crap that that's being shoveled. And then when they get to then they get to Elizabeth, and she's just got this kind of smirk on her face, like this is just the biggest bunch of snake oil she's ever you know she's ever seen. So everybody's reaction was a, was a little bit different. I, yeah, I think, I, I, I think that you know it, I, would, I think in a way the what he was saying that pastor was saying 
was speaking to them in a different ways. You know, like right. for 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 Paige, it was filling a, a, something empty inside her. You know, her heart is missing something. You know, and, and so this is filling that void in her heart. And again, yeah, I, I agree with like Elizabeth was saying. You know, she doesn't believe any of it. She's just, it's just like, they're going to take your money. They're just you know thieves and stuff like that. For and I, this is I, this is where I was saying I, I feel like for Philip, I feel like those words were hitting him home, close to home though. You know, because you don't have to be you know religious for what that guy was saying to have meaning, you know? Well, it, and that's a good point. And, and it comes up later at the end when he confronts the pastor and, you know, he asks a question. He's like, you know, do you really believe all the stuff that you're saying? Do you really believe that a, that a person can be, uh, you know, saved? And, and, all, and the pastor said, yes. And I think that you're right. I think it's the, the whole thing that, um, that Philip had, the look on his face and his whole attitude is his composure was that he couldn't resolve in his head, you know, his, I think his belief is that you do bad things, you're a bad person, and right. you're just you're just doomed. And this guy's up here saying, "No, that's not true at all." You know, Jesus loves everybody, blah blah blah. And he can't reconcile that in his head. He's it's there's a there's a disconnect that that he's struggling with. And, and I don't even need... go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I was just gonna say, and I thought it was just interesting how I thought it was interesting how how it was framed with. Philip with his extreme reaction on one side and Paige's extreme reaction on right. the other side and Elizabeth in the middle, you know, not buying at all. It was it was right. well shot. I like that. And I think what I, I and I when I and I like that like, you bring up that last scene because you don't have like going back to is like you know you don't have to be you know a churchgoer religious to to be talking about redemption. You know, many a man who's never believed in God has tried to redeem himself for bad acts or for things that he's done in the past, you know, um, you know, rich men who got their money in a dirty way will find, you know, some kind of heaven epiphany and it doesn't have to be God, but they try and redeem who they are, you know, to change who they are. And, uh, and I think that that's what's, what I feel like that's what Philip is struggling with, you know, it's like, how can I be redeemed? You know, it doesn't, and I think that even if he doesn't believe in, he doesn't believe in God, it's, it's, it's more of a, a deep thing in his soul about can I be can I ever be considered a good man, right? Um, and and I think that that's that scene at the end was 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 awesome too because I had no idea where where, where uh, Philip was going to go. You know, at first it seemed like he was going to burn down that church. He had the gloves yep. on. Yep. Like, you know, I and then I was afraid that he was going to you know, kill that pastor. I was yeah. I, I was convinced he was black gloves, and he gets right in the pastor's face and. I was like, he's gonna, he's gonna, you know, he'll kill him. But he leaves there. You know, he leaves there. He doesn't do anything. And I, I, and you know what? It, it, and the reason why I think is because the pastor never flinched. Like, right. You get this guy in front of you who's, you know, I don't think Matthew Reese is is a terribly physically imposing guy. But when you're dressed up in black and wearing black gloves, that kind of weighs in your, you know, that adds about twenty pounds of weight to you. Plus, and, when you're, you can see that he's all wiry too. He's all uh, he's amped up, ready to do something crazy, and you never know. You're right. But the pastor stood his ground, and even when Philip gets up in front, it gets in front of him. He never steps down. And I think that when, and and I, if I remember it correctly, when the pastor says something like, you know. What did he say? It was something along the lines of, you know, if you're going to do something, you know, uh, just know that, uh, you know, you can still be redeemed or that right. you're still a good person. And Matthew Reese or Philip steps right up to him. He's like inches away from him and says, you know, uh, and says, uh, do you really believe that? And the pastor never flinched. Like he didn't take the step back. He, he just stood his ground. And I think that that helped convey the full belief that the pastor has. He's, he's totally believes what he's saying. And I think that that's what I took away from it, that that's what caught Philip. If there had been a flinch in the pastor, I think it would have ended differently. But because he was so stolid and so steadfast, I think that it caught Philip off guard. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, it's interesting to me because the, you know, it feels like Philip is questioning what he believes in. You know, he's questioning yep. his his role in whatever this war is, and here he's face to face with a man who is who believes in something that you know Philip has been taught not to believe in, and he is so and he is you know he stands his conviction. Like you said, he doesn't flinch. I wonder if that will have an impression on him for the rest of the season. Um, it certainly didn't when he got home because when he got home, he he laid into 
the page and and did a terrible thing by tearing up her Bible, which was yeah. Uh, which I, I to me, I was like, whoa. I mean, I you know, I, I I think I've said this before, but I go to church, so, but I think that even it's it's something to do something like that for, for of any piece of property that someone believes in. You know, if it was you know your favorite novel that had some that spoke to you, to have that just just, just a uh, it's just one of those acts that you even though it's not a it doesn't hurt her physically, it's almost a spiritual slap in the face, you know. And I, and I thought his line when he uh, when he yells at her, he tears the, the pages out, and then he says, or he says, "You respect Jesus, but not us." You're right. And, and that was that was such a great line. And it's it, you know even outside of even step away from the show, you know step into real life and and how regular people are about you know the Bible and church and religion and all that. And there is there's a much greater respect for the you know that. Um, I don't want to call it mythology, but that, you know, religion and, and all that, there's a much greater respect for that than there is for people amongst, you know, each other. So, right. um, but I, I thought that was, I thought that was a, 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 you know, a great line. And, and again, it's the same, it's the whole, uh, it's the whole, uh, uh, play in both sides where, you know, he accuses her of, of, of lying or do you even know how to tell the truth? And she's like, do you? Yeah. And, you know, and again, that's like a slap in his face. Like, yeah, we tell lies and that we expect you to do one thing, but we're doing this. And yeah, the conflict is, is huge. It is huge. And it's great because, you know, if if this, I mean, this could be a scene from freaking parenthood, you know, I mean, except that they're KGB spies, you know, Um, and and you know what I'm saying? It's like she, it could be any TV show about teenagers where the teenager has caught the parent of the lie. And, and she doesn't know the extent of their lying. She just knows that they've lied to her. Right. Right. And um, well, it was funny. Seeing and she hasn't spoken about. It. She's never confronted them about the things. You know, that's the thing. She caught that her mom was out that one time. Um, remember that last the first season where she needed her mom and she went in the bedroom. And the bedroom was empty. Right. And she's caught her mom in a lie, but she's never confronted her about it. So right. A, which is a typical teenage thing to do. You know? Well, yeah, and 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 I thought it was interesting, Elizabeth. Um, you know, she's just watching this interplay between. Paige and Philip, and then uh, she, when Philip leaves, you know, even she's trying to calm him down when he's ripping the pages out. And he's, she's like, Philip, Philip, and then she goes upstairs, and you know, she confronts him, and she's like, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's, uh, um, you know, what happened down there, and and Philip just goes, you know, this is just a lot easier for you, and she's like, you think this is easy for me, and he, and I love that he didn't say anything. It wasn't like, well, yeah, because and he just looks at her and just walks past. I mean, that says it all. But then what followed after that, I thought was a really great scene too. Where where is she down in the? Is she in her room or she's? I think she's in her room and she thinks about it a second. She thinks about it a second, and then she goes into Paige's room, wakes Paige. Oh, uh, she's in the kitchen. She's in the living room because she looks back room, in the right. Bible, sitting on the counter. That's right. That's right. So then she goes up and gets gets Paige, brings Paige down. Paige is like, "Why? Yeah, why, why, why are you waking me up at two in the morning?" Okay, so you need to clean the cabinet, and then fold the laundry downstairs, and then uh, scrub the floor. And I thought that was a great line. It's like, "You want to be an adult? You want to see what being an adult is like? We do things that we don't want to do, and we never have time to, you know, for things that we want to do, and blah blah blah." That's what being an adult is. You want to you want to play. You want to play adult? You want to see what it is? This is what it is. Yeah, it was. A, it was a kind of a creepy thing. <laughs> it was like one of those. It was a little, yeah. It was. I mean, it was just like you know, it was like those mommy dearest moment. You know, I was yeah. Like, that's exactly. what I was thinking. It's like I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night so you can start cleaning. What? Yeah. And uh, no and, wire hangers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, it was just like, can you imagine your mom? I mean, you know, I guess there could be far worse, like finding out that your parents are. You know, ruthless killers for the KGP. So, right. Um, yeah, the whole thing with Paige was was interesting, and I continue to believe that that's going to come to a head in a bad way. And it may not be this season; it may be, it may be next season. I'm not sure, but she's so she's going to find out something uh, soon, and and I wonder if that will be a turning point or not. You know, I wonder how that will play into the show because I. I, I would imagine that Philip. I mean, I'm, I, I imagine both of them would do whatever they could to save the kids. And if the KGB says no, they had to die or something because they know stuff, then it scares me. 
because I like those characters. So, and so, so yeah, Philip's journey was intense this week. Uh, and another great scene was it, uh, it really struck me was uh, he has a meeting with the uh, with the the Zodiac killer. <laughs> I can't oh, yeah. remember his name. As Fred. a meeting, Fred, who uh, was uh, was Emmett's uh, contact. And uh, Fred has said that the FBI has, come, has, has called me in, and I'm supposed to go in and get an interview. And uh, you know, it's it's an interesting scene because Fred's like, "You you didn't contact me. You're not my guy," you know. And and uh, and Philip assures him that uh, uh, you are my guy. We're we're a team now, you know. He tries to build up his, "Hey, come on, we're together in this." You know, right. Thing. But after that, which was a fairly standard scene, you know, there's kind of leading some plot along. But really, the, the, to me, it was the follow-up scene of that, which was Philip, after Fred leaves, then we come back and Philip is just sitting on a bench overlooking the water, still in his disguise, yeah, still in his long hair, hippie disguise with the mustache, mustache and he's just staring, and he's totally lost. And some old guy goes, are you all right, son? And uh, you know, he just gets up and walks away. And what struck me about that was that... He, well, I, I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but what was interesting to me was like he's sitting there and he's obviously lost. And he's like probably one of those who am I moments that we have all had where you're just like, I don't know what's going on with my life. Who am I? What, what, what am I doing with my life? You know? Right. And I thought it was interesting that he's having that moment while he's still in a disguise. Yeah. While he's still got the, the hair and the, make, and, the, and the mustache on. Because, and we've talked about this before, how – there's got to be a psychological thing going on with these people. It's like an identity the, crisis. Exactly, exactly what I was thinking. And and I thought that that was another, I mean, that's another very interesting and moving scene because he's having that moment, but he doesn't know who he is, and, and we don't know who he is. You know, he, he's sitting there. He's like, is this who I am? Am I this guy in this mustache? Is that who I'm really supposed to be? Am I supposed to be the killer KGB guy? Who, who am I supposed Am I supposed to be the good father that uh, that raises the kids? I yeah, he's he's searching for that for the one searching. of his identities. One of his identities that's gonna that's going to bring clarity as to who he is. So we see him as Clark with Martha after that. Oh right, yes, that's a great scene too. And it's it's kind of like yeah, you know, she's like oh, you know, rough day. He says yeah, it's been it's really bad. And she's like uh, she says something like what'd she say? Something like uh, I understand. And he lights into her. He's like, how can you understand? You don't know anything that I do. And she was kind of like. Okay, calm down, you know, and and uh, and even that, even even trying to even trying to hide in that identity, uh, the comfort that he's got there with yeah. Martha. Well, he can't hide there either because he goes and gets the tape, pulls it out, the tape that he had mixed that has right. Dad talking poorly about Martha, and yeah. plays it for her. And you know, so it's like. In in, in in he's almost like a mirror image of Stan. It's like Stan can't get no satisfaction either in anything he does. Right. Something always seems to kind of step in and and screw it up. And uh, and and Philip is just. And then we see it where you know she you know they're Martha and Philip are together. Uh, Martha and Clark are together on the end of the bed, and she leans over and she's you know she starts undressing him. <laughs> I said I said to laugh at the one line that was like, uh, "Do you want me to use my mouth?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, you um, know, it's funny because, you know, the more I think about it, it's like he he kind of went over there for some comfort, but he was also going over there with like the, if you're not going to be happy, if I can't be happy, then you can't be happy. That's true. That's that's a good point. Yeah. But, and, and, but it just makes me, you know, we kind of take it for granted when he shows up in as Clark, but the effort that has to go into becoming Clark, I mean, he has to pin that wig on just perfectly so it won't come off, right? right. And, he kind of, and he has to get clothes on. I mean, is this like a, an hour procedure that he has to do in order to go over and to hang out with her? So, so he has had, so this whole, he has to, had to have said, I'm going to Martha's. And I'm going to play her that tape because if I can't be happy, she can't be happy. And then he's like, but maybe he's thinking, but maybe she'll come for me. I don't know. And so the whole time he's like, has to get ready. It's like a date. You know, yeah. it's a weird thing that he would have had to have gone through in order to go over there with the tape player to decide whether he's going to play the tape or not, or if he's just going to seek comfort with her or not. I, it, again, it's I just I wonder like, how many spies have had multiple personality disorders as a result I'm of their serious. job. I'm serious. Seriously. No, absolutely. Because you got to figure one of them, one of the roles that you're playing has to be a lot better than all the other ones. And what if fantasy, one of your fantasy roles is better than the real life role that you're playing? 
even though your fantasy role is tied to your real life because that's the role that you got to play. That's an interesting. You know, it's interesting you just brought that up because I never caught the parallel between Stan and Philip before. And, you know, we've talked about Stan and how he was undercover before the show begins in his previous life. Right. And, and how that affected him. And if you think of a, I think all you have to do is like say yeah, like the Donnie Brasco movie. If you've seen Donnie Brasco, you know how uh, Johnny Depp's character is, is an undercover cop working for the mob, but he falls in with the mob so well and he learns to like those people so well. And this is something that happens all the time. You become a member of the mob even though you're undercover. You have this other family over there and it's hard for you to kind of, you know, you have to walk this fine line. And for Stan, when he decides to take this job and he's going to become a normal guy again, it was hard for him because who knows what he had to do in that other job, right? Right. Maybe that life was better than his home life is. Right. And, um, and you know, it's interesting that you bring that up about split personalities and a KGB agent and a spy because it's a similar thing, you know. He, for, for Philip, being, you know, he loves Elizabeth. We know that. But he gets emotionally what he needs. He, he gets that from Martha. Mm-hmm. So it's right. a, and so that it's a, it's a hard, you know, and, and it's not like he's having an affair. Right. He's a different person. He's he's portraying so it's like it's different than like Stan and Nina because that's an affair, that's an illicit uh, relationship. Right. This is he's acting as another person, which is like he's, it's almost like a split personality. It's a different personality. So um I never really kind of put that together. I wonder if someday when when Philip gets caught by Stan, they can commiserate or something like that. <laughs> there was this one time when I was with the the, the Ku Klux Klan and in the biker gang back in oh yeah, oh that reminds me of the time. There was this time I was dressed up like a young Jean Shallot, and uh... <laughs> and I and then somebody saw me walking out of the building and they wanted my review of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, so I had to improvise. It was very very confusing. Uh, well, speaking of Stan, so I think we've gone over everything with with Philip. Like I said, it was just an incredible episode for for Matthew Reese. He really. I don't know what the, I don't know what they're they're mailing out for the Emmy screeners. They usually I can tell you from experience, from personal experience, that they, they usually mail out one or two episodes okay. uh, for a show. Although for the Americans last year they mail out the whole series. Um, if they were smart, they would pinpoint that episode and say, "Please watch this episode through Matthew Reese because the, the acting is just so." Because well, he's all year, over the place in the episode. Wasn't Margot Martindale the only one nominated off the cast last year? I mean, I Americans was, was up for a show, but um, I think she was the only one. I don't one think any of the, yeah, I don't think either of the two actors got nominated. So yeah. hopefully that changes this year. I, oh, God, this show is, this show is just, I mean, we talk about this all the time. It's a weird thing because you watch it and you feel like it's supposed to be just pulpit entertainment. Right. You know? And it's working on so many different, the production value, the writing, the direction, the attention to detail is, is, um, is so good. It's. I mean, it, to me, it's better than. I mean, I I enjoy it more than than uh, than Mad Men. Yeah. You know? Well, it, the other thing too is that it, it, uh, none of the acting on on all the way down to just the the you know the um, not fill in people the the lesser uh, the, 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 the you know the one parts the, the guest stars you know like yeah. that, that pastor this week was like, phenomenal oh the pastor he was great or Lewis last week or the guy at the uh, at the uh, shipyard you know with the, yep. the propeller like yep. even all of those performances are are terrific and nobody's there's like nobody phoning it in there's no weak performance anywhere and it's right. that's that's a rarity to find right right um. Okay, well, we can move on to Stan now since we've uh, covered Philip. We've kind of covered Elizabeth. Um, but really the two big stories were Stan and, and Philip. And Stan has started – Stan has become B.A. Beeman uh, as we yeah. brought up last week. He's just like – he's taking he's taking names, man, and he wants to bring down uh, Oleg. And um, he's he started his investigation into uh, – into Oleg and he's calling people in and he's, it was a great whole sequence of scenes where he was interviewing people and they kept cutting between the different interviewees uh, from Stan, you know, and it was just, um, the best part about that was at the very end when he's, uh, what was the guy's name again? Fred. 
Fred. He's interviewing Fred, and Fred says, I would never betray my country. And Stan says, you know, you'd be surprised at what... He says, no one, no one ever imagines they will. Right. And that's such a telling line coming from Stan. Oh, know? yeah. That's, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was great. I mean, that, and that he, the way Noah Emmerich delivered that line, it could have been so telegraphed, so obvious, you know. But he delivered it in a way that was like, like really, like, pained. Yep. It's, it was, um, he was great in this episode. And the investigation is interesting to me because I'm wondering how far this is going to reach, you know, how, how much is going to happen. Um, well, what I like about what I like about Stan is, is in, in this episode, especially, is that uh, you know, too often in shows and I'm going to call one out that I, I can't stand the show um, just because of what they do to law enforcement. But the following so, <laughs> the following just I, lights up. And, and I'm not sure if uh, Southgate Media Group has a podcast for the following. I, I think we might actually now that I think about it. Uh, you're gonna listen get, to it. I'm, I'm sure it's fabulous. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> But uh, no, but like, okay. So we, we've got Stan, and we've talked about this before about how Stan has a has a has a reputation or a history when he was doing undercover work before that apparently he was the man, like he was right. he was good at what he did. And then he comes in and and he bumbles around a little bit, and he's the he's the 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 sad Joe, and he's caught between the wife and the the mistress and and all that stuff. But then there's flashes of brilliance in the in the kind of agent that he is, like when he caught the the would be assassin, you know. Right. Uh, and and then he kind of, like we said last week, I think last week was another sad sack episode for Stan. And he redeems himself again this week where somebody comes in and uh, – or Martha comes in and she mentions that uh, uh, she knew the date of something because the DOD murder uh, uh, happened on the day of – Oh, oh, yeah. That, that's Leanne's set up murder. the end because <laughs> that's, uh, that's – yeah, you can go on. I, that, that what Martha says – Brings up something we talked about last week, so go on. Yeah, and and he and Stan's like, wait, what murder? And she's like, oh, the one that was, you know, the or he says, oh, the family. And then uh, Martha says, yeah, and he says, go get me all the evidence. Right, which is it, you you bringing up that murder. I think the previews next week showed him looking at the photo, the the, the two drawings of uh, Philip yes. and Elizabeth, and we talked about that last week, which was how that story just kind of got dropped. And now it's being brought back, which is great. I'm, I'm happy. Um, I was thinking about something about Stan while you were talking, and uh, um, I, I texted you earlier today. I said, "Oh, the thing that stuck out with me about this episode was uh, was uh, Philip suffering through PTSD." You know, yep. And he's and now I'm just thinking. I think that's what Stan has. I really do. I think that Stan is when he is in. Uh, excuse me, like when he's in the shit. You know, as they would say, um, he's on the ball. He knows what to do. Yep. When he needs to investigate something, when he needs to to get a case solved, when he needs to chase down a, an assassin to stop him from happening, that guy is like one of the best FBI agents. You have no right. question why he would be, you know, promoted to where he was. But when it's just the sitting around and the thinking and nothing's going on, the dealing with his family and the mundane stuff of his family and how his well, his wife's leaving him, you know, well, his wife's not just leaving him; she's having an affair and telling him about it. <laughs> but all that stuff, you know, all those things. That are just regular day life. He can't process that. Yeah, and that's what makes me again think of what happened to him before he became got reassigned. Yeah. And I think it is a form of PTSD where he can only function, he can only perform at this high level where he is the investigator, where he's the, the top cop. And um, yeah, one. I mean, that's an, to me that's an interesting makes the stand a little more interesting now because maybe we're not. He's not sad, Zach. Maybe he's. He's depressed. He's he's in a fog. He can't think straight, you know. Because we saw it last week. We saw it this week, where he's investigating these people. He and then he says, "What? What? You that, that scene that you brought up at the end, where he says, give me all the information about that murder.' It's like he's, he's his brain is working. It's woken up again. And um, and we saw that in the first season. Yeah. Um, and to, uh, and it's like that, that lull, you know, every case has uh, peaks and valleys. And when you get in that valley, it seems like he, he, needs, he needs to be working up here at a high level at all times for him to, to be functioning. And the rest of the time, he's kind of making stupid mistakes and, and, and uh, botching everything, you know. Well, it's like that, you know, I was thinking about, uh, like you said, the highs and lows. And there, there's still one thing that uh, out of Stan's, the entire story about Stan, there's still just one event that sticks out to me that's just – it's it's odd, and it lends it totally lends credence to your whole PTSD uh, 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 synopsis. Is um, 
uh, what's the name of the uh, what's the name of the guy he shoots in the head? Uh, oh, what is, Nina's friend? We're just yeah. gonna call him Nina's friend from now on because I you I remember, never remember this guy's name. I, I, <laughs> I will I will look it up while you give your point. How about that? Okay? <laughs> so it's the out of all the things that Stan has done, Stan has when like you said when Stan's on a mission, Stan is. He's calculating. He's very. It, 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 everything falls into a into a into play. There's not. He's not reckless. He's not. Uh, you know. He's he's not a, uh, a a lone wolf out there. And so that one incident where he where he shoots the Nina's friend. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna laugh because Nina's friends is the most common Russian name ever. Vlad. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> we are idiots. But go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so when he shoots Vlad, that, that still just sticks out to me. It's like, that was, that was just pure emotion and, and, uh, you know, that, that was an unthinking moment for, for Stan, which yeah. is, is, is odd for him. Right. I agree. Um, so let's, so let's back up a second. Let's talk about Stan's wife. So, uh, Sandra, when we see her, she's in the bedroom and what's playing on the radio? Dr. Ruth. Oh, that's right, Dr. Ruth. Dr. Ruth last time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, back before there was Howard Stern, we had uh, Dr. Ruth to, uh, to uh, you know, live our fantasies through. Uh, <laughs> I so never anyway. listened to Dr. Ruth, man. Oh, no? Never. I mean, I think maybe once. Okay, neither did I then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sam comes in and You she's listen got, to Dr. Ruth? Maybe a couple times. Did it help? No. Because <laughs> if you don't have game, it doesn't matter how much you know. <laughs> you, see, you, just... you could have stored that knowledge for future use. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so Stan comes in. And and see, Stan... you wouldn't be where you are now, Jeff. Right. You wouldn't have your wife because you might have been the sexual dynamo and then you would have had all these women and you never would have met your wife. That's true. That's true. See, so it all, it's all for a reason. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. That's right. So... Sandra <laughs> is packing and Stan comes in and he says, you know, what's going on? You know, where are you going? And, oh, my mother's sick and you know, I'm going to go stay with her. And then she breaks down you know, and she's like, all right, I'm not going to see my mother. She's not sick. I'm going away with uh, this guy from Est that uh, uh, the cult. Yeah, the cult. And because we, we we've developed an emotional connection between the two of us. So basically, like you said before, she's telling Stan, I'm going to go have an affair. And then, uh, which, you know, Stan follows up. He's like, wait, are you telling me that you're going to have an affair? And she says, uh, she says, well, tell me that you haven't had one. And worst poker face ever. Yeah. Twitch, twitch, <laughs> did the twitch. Ah, 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 ah. Yeah, at least answer, do something. Don't just stand there and just, you know, be silent. So, um. I, but, huh, what, huh? No, uh, no. But we go, but we go from Stan, who's on the case examining evidence and trying to connect. Wait, I just made a connection. The DOD thing with the, with these two dead bodies. And then he can't even lie his way out of, uh, you know, a simple question. Tell me you're not having an affair. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, he can't do the home life. He's not good at that, you know? I mean, he's, he's good with Nina because it's, it's, it's spy related. Again, what we talked about, the multiple personality thing. That yeah. that he's got that little fantasy life that he's living that, that works so much better. And then I, I thought I I like her line. She says, I'm not leaving you, but I'm not waiting around for you to get the courage to leave me. Right. So uh Poor Stan. Poor Stan. Well he yeah. My favorite scene in the entire show, the best scene so far this season, was Gad sitting down with Ivana. With Arcady? Arcady. Yeah, that oh, was yeah. best scene ever. That was B A Gad. Um, I, I mean, I when that scene started, I'm like, what, why is he drinking coffee? What is this? And then he sits down, and I had to pause the TV because I was like, holy crap, this is awesome! Yeah, and it's just like, oh, it was awesome. And you know what? The best part about the scene, of course, you know, he sits there and he says, "I'm in trouble," and unless your your people accept that this guy died in a mugging, now what guy are they saying died in a mugging? That 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 assassin. Uh, I thought, oh, is it the guy that got shot in the head? Yeah, Vlad. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Unless this guy says we, he died in a mugging. Oh, wait, wait. Are you serious? Did you just look the guy's name up and then just no? I'm trying. Just to, I couldn't. I, I was <laughs> no. I didn't realize that that 
Is this whole time the reason they've been investigating? That's why he's in trouble is because of Vlad. Vlad? Oh, I'm an idiot. I I thought it was because they let the assassin slip through their fingers. This whole time, I thought that that's why they was in trouble. I'm pretty sure it's Vlad. No, that makes much more sense to me. And anybody listening, if either if if we're incorrect, I'm about sure this, you're then, right. I'm incorrect. I got to be incorrect because it doesn't make sense that oh you stopped an assassin just in time, but right. that Vlad. Died. Okay, well, <laughs> right. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. Um, I just get caught up so much in the show that it just takes a lot of me. I don't know, Jeff. I don't know. But what a great poker player Arcady is. Well, they like, both are. I They're mean, great. He, he just sat there, and and as 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 Gad is is laying it down, you know, like you said, if I'm in trouble, that means you're in trouble, and if I go down, you're going down, and all that whole operation you got going over there, I say just, bye bye. Yeah, I just love the fact that he says, um, "All your illegals are in here," you know. Yeah. Yep. It's gonna it's gonna hit the fan, buddy. You know, it's not, it's gonna get leaked to the press. Blah blah blah. It's just like you know. I just love that he played it. It's like I know you guys got illegals here because we probably have we got spies over there, you know, and uh, that's the way it is, and we know it is. And uh, and but for uh, me, that scene was like that's that scene. Seeing those two guys at the same table because we've seen them how we've seen them for the, you know two seasons so far. That was scene was was uh, De Niro and Pacino. I was gonna say it was from Heat. Yep. Yeah, it was the best scene. And yep. the best part about that was like Arcady gets up and he goes. I've always heard about the great Frank Gadd. I've always wanted to meet him. You know, I thought it would be under different circumstances. I was like, who is Gadd? He's a crazy, he's got this reputation for being such a uh, badass. I'm like, you keep hearing these things that kind of come out, you know, and it's like, I like this guy. Richard Thomas is so cool in that part, you know. But isn't it funny how they they know each other? They know each other at work and they're like, you know. It's no 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 BS pretensions like who are you again? I don't um yeah. It's, well, yeah so to me it's like it just, I just wanted to be set up more more coffee scenes. <laughs> just the two of them getting together and chit-chatting about, you know, life, you know. Two old war guys sitting there talking and um and then it's like being like Magneto and Professor X talking oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, they, they hate each other. Well, they're on the other sides, but they can sit to get together and have a cup of coffee. It's like, okay. It's like um, the end of the old, uh, what's that? You remember those cartoons with the uh, the coyote and the, the sheepdog? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. well, and it's like they, you know, the sheepdog. Yeah. Yeah, she thought would chase him the whole thing, and then a whistle would blow, and they go, "Yeah, see you tomorrow, friend." Okay, Wally. And it's like yep. that's what that is, you know. It's like these two guys just me. I did, that scene was fantastic, I and mean, I did not expect that. I'm glad that they did not show that in any of the preview. That just so, just because that added to the the nice surprise of it, which was less like, whoa, you know. I loved yeah. it. I absolutely loved that scene. Uh, the only other thing that uh, came out in this episode was that uh, <clears throat> we learned that there are two uh, two big companies vying to build the stealth airplanes. Lockheed and Northrop Grumman. That's right. And th- there's, I, were you thrown, like, there's a the cuts to an AA meeting. And uh, at the, towards the end of the episode, they, we cut to this AA meeting that uh, Elizabeth is in attendance of. And she's listening to everybody talk about, uh, you know, recovery and basically, hey, redemption, which is what, you right. know, kind of. Uh, and for a second there, until I saw what was going on, I thought that that was Elizabeth's way of dealing. You know, I did too. Same thing. Because, like, obviously going to church is not her thing, but right. hearing w- hearing other people talk about their problems and say, you know, kind of realizing I'm not alone. Uh, again, and I can sometimes I can't read the way Carrie Russell has played stuff, cause she, and she makes, it looked like she was getting something out of it. It was interesting to me. It looked like, you know, we're hearing people talking about trying to better themselves. Um, really, it looked like she was getting something. That's why I think maybe you thought the same way, that this was her getting something out of the meeting. She was there to listen. And, and totally but, plays into, just to interrupt you, it totally plays into what we know about her with her past. She could totally right. have been a drinker to, you know, kind of get away and, and you know, escape and, and, and just deal with stuff. So, oh, yeah. So when it, well, when she's modeled tr- everything that happened to her, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's still dealing with that. She's still dealing with those issues that she can't, you know, it's... Um, she can't really talk about it, you know. She can't talk about. She hasn't been. She's never been able to talk about it with Philip. So who does she talk about it to, you know? And she can't. She had to watch her. Her, you know, two. Her two friends are dead. You know, her one friend was, uh, what was her name? Leah, Leanne. 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 God, I'm really. I guess I need my notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but Leanne's dead, and she thought that Lucia was going to be someone that she could probably connect with. I mean, I really got that feeling, and that she had to let her die. 
and Stan's wife is, you know, out having a fling with S guys. So, yeah. So she's really, you know, she's isolated and alone. She has nobody. I mean, which is interesting. I just thought, you know, it's like, wow, that's some, um, there's got to be some other jealousy going on or some envy going on with, with Clark, with Philip, because he has these connections to all these people, you know. Yeah. And, um, anyway, Elizabeth, uh, ends up having a conversation with this woman who's giving her testimony. It turns out, where is she an employee of, Jeff? She's with uh, Northrop. She's with Northrop. So it's all it was all a scam. It's all a ruge. Ruse. Rouge? Uh, rouge. It was and all makeup? Was put, it was all makeup. It's fake. God, I'm terrible at these podcasts. I'm going to stop. <laughs> Open no, my but- mouth. And it's as the words are coming out, I can say, no, you're not going to, no, don't say that one. And I try and grab it, and it's gone. It's already there, and, and it's there to be made fun of. Um, okay, uh, I'm an idiot, and we'll continue on. <laughs> no, but uh, but the uh, yeah, you're 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 right with uh, with Elizabeth. The, everything is uh, is about the job, and there's no uh, you know there's there's no. Remember, she used to hang out with Sandra, and she yeah. doesn't have that. Uh, you know, they don't they don't hang out anymore. Um, oh no! So she has uh, nothing. She doesn't even have the kids anymore. She had Paige. She was trying to form a relationship with Paige, but she's basically. Uh, she's helped drive Paige away. And she doesn't have a relationship with Henry because Henry is a boy and he wants to hang out with his dad and they have a bond and she just, you know, she, I mean, you know, he, he, she's not really tried to form a bond. She's not really tried to form she a bond. She has zero interaction with Henry. She really does. Yeah. Not, not at all. I agree. It's crazy. I would say they're the worst parents ever, but they, they are the worst parents ever because, you know, they're spies. She doesn't want to be a mom. I mean, I think Philip tries. She wants, I don't know, she's tough, man. She wants to be a mom, but she doesn't know how. You know? Right. Yeah, no, she's she's a very, she, she's very complex, and, and I think as soon as she starts feeling too much in one direction, she yanks herself back, and then... That's a great point. It's a great point. she feels herself point. going too much motherly, she yanks herself back, so she's she just constantly oscillating. Yeah. She doesn't know how to deal with those emotions. She feels too much love for Paige and Henry, and she feels the job pulling her back. I'm not supposed to love them. They're just, they're just, um, they're just agents of of they're my ornaments reasons. on this on this life. Uh, this this cover. That yeah, I they're have. just they're just part of my cover. But then she'll see someone like Emma and, and Leanne who love their children dearly, and she'll say, "Oh, that's the way I'm supposed to be," or she'll watch Philip go interact with the kids, and she'll say, "That's the way I, I should be," and. She, yeah, she's afraid to really express her emotions. She's a, she, she, they're one messed up family. Yeah, I'll tell are. you what. I mean, at some point, I think <laughs> Paige is going to get a gun. They're all going to get guns, and it's just going to be everybody in the house shooting. <laughs> except Henry. Except Henry will be at the neighbor's house playing Coleco Vision at this point. That's right, Coleco Vision. It's straight around the corner. Uh, you know, hey, on a, on a side note, now that they dug up all those ET Atari cartridges, oh my gosh, I saw that. Yeah, I hope that they use one of them on the Americans. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> would be awesome. That'd be a nice little joke. Well, for those well, for those of us who don't understand what Scott just talked about, uh, Atari back in the day made an ET game that was panned as like the worst game ever made, and there was I a think rumor, so. I know somebody who had that. There was a rumor. Uh, that um, that uh, Atari basically uh, took a million of these of these ET games and buried them in a landfill somewhere. It's a, it was an urban legend. When you know what was it? It's been thirty years now, basically. And uh, well, they just dug up a landfill. I don't remember where. And sure in enough, Mexico. in Mexico. And sure it? enough, there's a million ET uh, <laughs> uh, game. For, pristine. The packages are a little oh, yeah. beat up. But they're pristine shape, man. <laughs> That's the best so that means part everybody who's got one of those on eBay, yeah, your price they, is going to come. They way paid down. like a thousand dollars for it. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, doesn't, doesn't have, don't work now. Doesn't work. Although they might be the only ones that work, and the ones that the kid dug up are all dusty and stuff. Yeah, that's funny. Well, that was a quick hour. That was a quick. We did hour. a good job. If only we were this way every week, Jeff. I know we might have to. We have to change our uh, our our like, strategy. We might get more fans. Say. We have more people, listeners, if we were only talk for an hour instead of three. That's true. That's true. It's my fault. I apologize. I just start talking and I can't stop. <laughs> and on that note, do we have? <laughs> I, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> Thank you. I think. 
How about some random crew members, Jeff? Uh, random crew members. Uh, the do one we have that, any random this week? Sure, we do. I've, I've well, got, then, I've then I get to say. Uh, the one that, that I it's the random crew members. Okay. Are you still talking? It's the random. I'm trying to do my best, Barry White. I've got this expensive microphone. Random crew members of the week. Here they are, ladies and gentlemen. Bring them on in, Jeff. Who's our first random crew member of the week? All right. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was creepy. Uh, <laughs> it, was it I, Barry White? I'm sorry. I, I got to call out um, Nathan Barr. We've we've mentioned him before, but Nathan Barr did the music. Oh um, yeah, and his music this week was it was great. It He's was the guy I, we had mentioned before who has the Human Bone Instrument Collection and. Um, anyway, it was I mean skeleton stuff. bones. Yes. Okay. Family show. I just want to make sure that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yes. That's what I was talking about. Okay. Um, so I found this guy, uh, his name is just pretty cool. So I had to, uh, that's what he's getting a shout out. Xanthus. Oh, wait, so Nathan was our first one? No, no. We, we've mentioned him before. Oh, okay. Sorry. I just want to give him props for, for me. I just want to interrupt you a few more times. Yes. I'm sure there'll be a few more. Xanthus <laughs> Valen. Ooh, what a name. What does exactly. Xanthus do, baby? So Xanthus is the uh, is one of the there's several ads. Okay. Um, he's known for working on Silver Linings Playbook, American Hustle, and Noah. Wow, those are uh, three big, two big directors right there that he's worked with, which is uh, um, Darren Aronofsky. Yes. For Noah, and uh, David Russell for the other two. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And now he's working on Americans. He's got he's got a good resume. Yeah. Uh, going to the uh, special effects department. Love special oh. effects. It's oh, really I do too. As well, my the friend Pyro- Tony just did uh, the new Katy Perry video. Da- not Dark Horse. No, the new new one. Happy birthday. Oh yeah, Tony. She's Dark like that? yeah, where she's like an old woman and she's a, a Jewish comic, and uh, yeah, he did all that stuff. Oh wow. Um, the pyrotechnician. <laughs> oh, he doesn't do pyrotechnics. But- <laughs> But on was the Americans, there a fire on this episode? Um, okay. Well, yeah, because when they were at Marshall Eagle. Oh, that's right. Yes, very good. Uh, so Jared Hartley, uh, known for his work on Moonrise Kingdom, That's Ooh. My Boy, and R.I.P.D. Wow, that's a diverse roster of movies right there. He was the uh, he was the special effects foreman on Infinitely Polar Bear. I don't know. What in the heck is that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm have to look that one up real quick. Infinitely polar bear. A manic depressive mess of a father tries to win back his wife by attempting to take full responsibility of their two young spirited daughters who don't make the overwhelming task any easier. Starring Robin Williams. Um, Zoe Saldana, Mark Ruffalo. Oh, I've heard remember that movie. Yeah, I don't think that ever came out. It's listed as 2014. Maybe it's not out yet. Uh, I think the, uh, it doesn't I say remember. post-production, but. Well, maybe it's. Okay. Yeah. Ruffalo is great. Yeah, you yeah. know what I saw that he's in? I just got to see the Normal Heart, um, the HBO movie. Oh, the, um, that's coming out at the end of May. He's excellent in it. The movie is excellent. Um, I just saw him in uh, in uh, Now You See Me. Oh yeah, uh, how is that movie? I didn't like it. I, okay, it's, gets wrapped up a little too easy for me. Did you ever see You Can Count on Me? No. Oh my God! You have to see that movie. That's the one. I think he got a cameo or nomination for it. It was like the early two thousands with him and Laura Linney and Matthew Broderick. Oh, that's a fantastic movie. I highly recommend that movie. Mark uh, Ruffalo. Since we'd like to bring up every uh, Tom Fontana, David uh, David Simon uh, tie-ins that we can, Mark Ruffalo started in a very short-lived, short-lived as in like probably only four episodes aired. It was an experimental show from Fontana and Levinson. On the UPN, it was one of their first shows. It was a cop show called The Beat. The Beat. And, uh, did you remember that? Did you ever yeah, see that yeah. show? And they, he played a street cop with this other guy who was a guy who wound up being on, um, on uh, oh, it was a guy who was on Treme. Anyway, but uh, the, exper- the experiment with the show was that they shot half of it on video and half of it on film. That was supposed to be like this little gimmick they had. That the, uh, the, I think the video part was when they were cops on the street and then a film. they switched to film when they were in their personal lives. Okay. All right. I wish they'd bring that show on like DVD or something, or just put it on uh, put it on Netflix. It's a cool little show. Huh. It'd be cool to see Ruffalo. I'm surprised that nobody's thought of that. I'm sorry. We're talking about random crew members. I'm Mark Ruffalo. All right, our last random crew member is Samantha Sharif. 
Samantha, I'm very sorry for interrupting your, your time in the spotlight, and I will not interrupt Jeff anymore. <laughs> well, she's listed as miscellaneous crew, but she was a writing a production, a writer production assistant. Um, okay. And she's basically So done, she worked for the writing department. Yeah. So she's worked as a writer production assistant on 13 episodes of The Americans. And then as a production assistant on a movie uh, that's in post-production now called 79 Parts. Film files a law student who, in his haste to pay a student loan, borrows money from the wrong people. He has to marry someone's Italian girlfriend to pay off his debts. Well, that's a weird name because I would think 79 Parts means he'd have to start selling off 79 parts of his body in order to pay back the loan. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The title, is, uh, the title is Hash. It's, a, it's a, like um, – a, a Hashtag seventy, yeah. Apostrophe seventy nine. So like, like the year seventy nine. Yeah. yeah, but yet I'm looking at the poster and I don't see that on the poster. I just see seventy nine parts. Maybe it's two thousand seventy nine. Maybe it takes place in the future, Jeff. I don't know, but Eric Roberts is in it. So and Sandra mm-hmm. Bernhard. Yeah. Oh, interesting combination. So you're probably gonna see it. I. Uh, it'll probably wind up in my. Uh, my <laughs> Please review our movie. Please <laughs> check out this movie, and it may be great. Who knows? I never want to knock a movie. Till I've seen. Uh, well, hey Jeff, it's been a great hour. I'm sorry to you know we've kind of we kind of were able to do it an hour. Just yeah, about. it's pretty good, pretty impressive for ourselves. Next week, I think it looks like an ex- this. Well, <laughs> next week, uh, two days from now, uh, the new episode premieres. And um, yeah, we're sorry like about our- being we're sorry about being late this week. Uh, life just kept getting in both of our ways, and uh- well, who knows at the rate we do these things, it might be up tomorrow, and it'll just be the t- <laughs> for the people listening to be like. <laughs> We're really talking about late. It was always about Tuesday. Jeez. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I think that that's it for this week. It's kind of a low key, low key episode, <laughs> comrades. I just want to say, that Scott Malvis, that's me. I'm an employee of Cartoon Network Studios and the Turner Broadcasting System. And the opinions and views expressed here by me are my own and do not reflect those of the parent company. And Jeff is employed to only himself. He is that's a right. self-employed. Hard-working man. And Scott's, Blue opinions, man. Scott's opinions aren't biased by me either. So yeah, like my opinions are my own, and Jeff <laughs> disagrees with them wholeheartedly. <laughs> I, I'm going to pull, pull Joe Pesci from uh, My Cousin Vinny. Everything that guy just said is BS. And I just want to say one other thing. It's like this is the last week. If you're listening to this uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday, uh, our Great Strides, the CF Foundation Great Strides, is this week, this Saturday. And if you're interested to contribute, make a contribution, you please check out uh, our Facebook page. The information is there. You can go to uh, Great Strides. Um, Sorry, www.cff.org. Uh, there's a link there. You can go to our my, my team webpage uh, for my son Jacob. And um, yeah. If you can help out, that'd be fantastic. If you can't help out, but you want to spread the info, spread the word, that's just as appreciated. And we thank you very much. And on that note, Jeff, I have nothing left to say. Do you have anything left to say? I'm done too. Awesome. Thank you for listening. I'm going to try to put up. Oh, I just want to say that on the Facebook page, I'm going to try to put up more uh, retro uh, intros to 80s shows. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> awesome. That's great. I loved it. And you know, I'll try and put up. Uh, well, I don't put up anything. I put up that interview with Matthew Reese, which was a good interview. That's right. It was a good. LA Times, yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, All right, folks, thanks for listening, and uh, please come back. And if you are listening on iTunes, please give us some stars. We really like it. We really like doing this. We really do. All right, have a great week. Take care. If you would like to donate to help pay for this and other Southgate Media Group podcasts, simply go to our website, southgatemediagroup.com, and click on the Donate button. It can be as little as a dollar or, well, as much as you want. (laughs) Help keep this fun going by supporting this and our other shows. Thanks again for listening, everyone. You're the best fans in the world.